Hello and good evening everyone. Welcome to HOPS Live Workshop number 12, the first of our 2021 program of live workshops on safety management systems. Please give me a hello in the comments uh, and let me know that the sound is working okay apart from anything else uh, and I might say hello back to you. Let me know who you are and which organisation you represent and I will say hello first of all to Adrian, keenest of all the viewers from China and Adam Williams from the Dean Forest and Christopher Berry. I'm afraid I don't know what railway you're from, Christopher, but if you tell me in the comments, I'll say hello. Hello, Phil Summers from the Epping Onga, Richard Lemon. Hello, Phil McIver from Telford, Jamie Brooker. Hello. You've got a very, very short railway, Jamie, but uh, it's always worth uh, having an SMS or even if you're not required to have an SMS, applying the principles of an SMS um, to good organization governance. Hello to Paul Richardson. Hello to John O'Hagan from the Great Western Society. Oh, thank you, Adrian, for letting me know that you can hear me. I'm on a different computer than I normally am, so I'm uh, quite glad that the sound is working. Uh, let's hope that uh, everything else works OK as well. Hello, Alistair from Bressingham. How are you? We'll give everyone a minute or two to join in. I did, um, I did deliberately start a minute or two early just to make sure that we didn't do our usual trick of late starting. So who else is watching? We've got 28 people watching. That's absolutely magnificent. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. I really hope this is going to be useful for you. Hello, Peter Richardson from the Neen Valley Railway. Official. Excellent. Uh, and Matthew Enticknap from the Yorkshire Wolds Railway. And Mark Hayton from the Alm Valley Railway. Ah, the A-team are definitely here. We've got all the good railways watching the Hops Live workshop. Number 12, which will start in a few minutes time. Thanks for the early stream start, says Adrian. Yes, no, I'm uh, terrible for starting these things late. So I thought I would start a little bit earlier. 30 people watching, according to Alexander Seal. Hello, Alex. Thank you very much. Hello, Stephen Hemingway. Joshua Watkins from, oh my goodness, Clenethley and Munith Mauer Railway, maybe. I'm not sure, 100%. Um, Alan Coulson from the Strathspey. Hello. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll give everyone a, another half a minute or so just to join because I know it's not 100% easy for everyone uh, to join in. Good evening, Ernest Ellsworth Wilson. Hello. Thank you very much to Ernest for his help in uh, putting this workshop together. Um, and thank you also to uh, numerous people who've sent in comments or their own drugs and alcohol policies. Uh, thank you to Peter Smith from uh, the West Somerset and the Gloucestershire Warwickshire. Thank you to Richard Lemon. Um, everyone's had a, um, uh, an input in this, which is good. And just to say before we get going that this is not a case of this is the workshop and when it ends, it ends. I'd like your comments after the workshop. I'd like you to send me um, maybe the extracts from your policy that you think are better than what we've uh, constructed here. Or if you disagree with something or if you think we've missed something, please do send it in. The workshop does not end when the video ends and I'll leave it a week or so or until the comments die down before publishing the best practice template. Um, but we'll come on to that uh, in a little while. Hello to Paul uh, Mills from the Cholsey and Wallingford and um, uh, Adrian. So, oh, I see. So uh, yeah, something about a DMU. OK, fair enough. Uh, uh, Ernest asks, is it permissible to have a beer whilst watching? Oh, my goodness me. Well, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not going to get bogged down in, in that. Right. OK, uh, let's make a start then. Uh, so. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm sure that um, everyone is at a different stage of SMS development and SMS maturity um, on their, their own railway. So uh, if you're uh, sitting there thinking, well, our SMS is, is pretty, really good, then please take part in the workshop and share what you know and your best practice with everyone else. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, our SMS could really do with some work, then hopefully this will be um, of benefit for you to learn from those first people that I mentioned. But I really do think that everyone has an opportunity to, uh, to feed into the workshop and everyone has the opportunity to take something out um, 
so that we can all learn from each other. I should say, I have, I'm afraid I haven't been that well recently, so I'm, I'm heroically struggled in to do this uh, workshop. But uh, if I start to lose my voice or anything halfway through, then, then I do apologise. Um, these workshops are going to take place at six week uh, intervals. You can see the programme uh, on the screen. And it's deliberately six weeks. It gives you enough time to mull over the contents of the workshop, make any um, comments that you want to, make any amendments to the template if you're going to choose to use the template, and deal with the, the local aspects of, of implementing it um, through your SMS change procedure, of course, um, before being bombarded with the next topic. So I thought it would be far too overwhelming to do them weekly or fortnightly, but I thought six weekly was, was just about right. Um, I will, um, I'll go through some uh, PowerPoint slides uh, first, and then uh, we'll just sort of share screens and, and go through a Word document uh, that, that we've been constructing. Uh, so, uh, as I've said, please join in, please share with others, learn from others. This video will be still on Facebook after the workshop ends and we'll also upload it to YouTube so that you can watch it from there. And I do look at the comments, uh, so, so feel free to make comments in either places uh, if you wish to. The aim of this is to construct, the output will be to construct a best practice set of SMS templates. We all um, are responsible for writing SMSs and it takes a lot of time, I know from my own experience, and it really frustrates me the all the things that we do separately on all the different railways that all take time and we're all doing them from scratch and coming up with very, very similar um, conclusions. So hopefully this workshop will bring some of that work together so that we don't all have to spend the same hour times 200 railways um, coming up with what our particular policy on a particular aspect is going to be um, because the, the workshop will give us a, a template to work from in that respect as a good as a good starting point. Hopefully that will save a lot of time and remember that even volunteer time is not free there is a cost so just because we're not paying people's wages to write SMSs does not mean that there's not a cost to their time. So there's a cost saving and a time saving and the sharing of best practice. And we've definitely learned over the years and more so with every passing year that as Heritage Railways, we all need to work together. We all need to share what we're doing because the burden on all of us is increasing all the time and we can't all cope forever doing things in silos. So hopefully this will share a bit of that, uh, bit of that best practice and reduce the burden on each individual uh, railway. We're not saying, we are not saying that this is what you must do. In a minute, we're going to talk through an SMS drugs and alcohol policy and, and, and even before that, some SMS stuff in general. And I, I'm not and I cannot say this is what you must do because it's not in my remit to tell you that. Um, the ORR might come along and tell you that and the ORR might tell you um, uh, what, what they expect to be in your SMS and what laws and rules it complies with and to enforce that. And that's definitely their job, not mine. So I'm not saying, and please don't take this as me saying, this is what you must do. I'm just going to give you what I think is one of a number of sensible answers to the problem. And it's up to you whether you follow it or not. And it's your responsibility to determine whether it's suitable for your undertaking. Every undertaking is different. And I can't say that what I'm going to say in this workshop is guaranteed to be suitable uh, for every single um, undertaking. Um, Adam says uh, in the comments that I should have done the change procedure first. Yes, I did agonize over what order to do these SMS documents in. Um, and the reason why I've gone for drugs and alcohol first is because I think that's going to be something that's going to be 99% the same on every railway and it's hopefully not going to be too controversial. We will do other controversial ones um, and I'm sure that'll create a lot of discussion, but I wanted to sort of dip our toes in the water uh, first with something that's going to be not, not too divisive uh, that we can work through. But just like everything else, we'll, uh, we'll go through everything eventually. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going until we run out of SMS uh, to write. Hopefully by which time everyone's SMS on every railway will be uh, absolutely bulletproof. Uh, right, so some words about the safety management system uh, in general and what the safety management system uh, should and shouldn't be. So 
The SMS is a description, a written description of how the organization will be run safely. It's completely up to you how wide you make it um, and what you decide to, uh, to include in it and not include in it and what you consider to be part of the SMS and what you consider to be a supporting document. Um, but overall, there has to be a collection of written words that express how the organization is going to be run safely, how we are going to discharge our safety responsibilities. So it might say, uh, for example, um, we will have a competence management system as a headline. And then somewhere in a, in a sub document or on a, on a further page through the SMS, it will say what that competence management system consists of. And it might say um, for every role that someone can do, there will be um, an assessment criteria and somebody who is qualified as an assessor will uh, gauge that person against the criteria and then they will make a decision on whether they're going to be competent or not. And again, going another level down the SMS uh, or a sub supporting document of the SMS, there'll be a list of what the criteria are for that person to be competent. And if it was something to do with P-Way, it might say bullet point one, select the right size spanner, bullet point two, um, put 200 Newton meters on that particular bolt, three, test it with a meter, whatever it is, um, it will be in the in the assessment criteria. And that multi-level approach to the SMS works quite well. A very high level statement, a detail of how it's going to be done, and then below that, the actual, uh, in this case, competence criteria that we work to. Um, it's really important that the uh, SMS and the contents of the SMS are informed by the risk assessments and are appropriate for the risks involved. Something that's really high risk and needs a high degree of uh, safety management needs to appear and, and, be, um, and be extensively covered uh, in the SMS. Things that don't attract so much risk perhaps don't need so many words in the SMS. Things to do with boilers and steam locomotive management and P-way and level crossings, um, all those things really high risk and really need to be nailed down in a document that is part of the SMS. Um, ice cream shops and things like that, I'm sure they will have a, a safety aspect to do with electrical wiring and to do with fire extinguishers and things like that, but perhaps not quite so, uh, so voluminous in, in the SMS. I should say as well that there are things that need to be in the SMS from a ROGS railway um, legal point of view, and there are things that fall into other um, sort of parts of law that we're required to manage on, on safety. I've always found it easier just to say, this is our railway's SMS, and whatever the law is that requires us to have it, we're going to put it in the SMS. And I found that's quite a good tight way of making sure that we maintain control over what's going on in the organization, whether that's to uh, meet our responsibilities under ROGS or the Health and Safety at Work Act or PUA or LOLA or any of those other uh, laws and rules that relate to safety uh, that we have to cope with. Crucially, we must, must do what we say we will do. It is the worst possible thing to have an SMS that says we're going to do this Y and Z and then to not do it. Because the day that an incident occurs and it is a mathematical certainty. One day an incident will occur. Even the best run railways have incidents. The first thing that will be looked at, one of the top things that will be looked at is the SMS. And to find that the SMS says we will test that every day. And then in reality, we haven't tested it for two months. And that's what led to an incident. We're guilty of not following what we said we would do to discharge our health and safety responsibilities. And this is one of the reasons why it's not that easy to go out and take an SMS off the shelf and say, that's our SMS, because it's got to be appropriate for the specific undertaking. It's got to be something that has been thought through and that the, uh, the staff from the directors down to the frontline staff um, at the organization are going to follow and are going to live by. And if it's impractical, then it's not going to be lived by. And if it doesn't cover the risk, then it's, it's, it's not fit for purpose. So you've got to pitch for something that is uh, that is appropriate. Now, what we've written in terms of, of the template that we're going to look through today has obviously been designed to be appropriate for heritage railways in general. But as I said, I can't guarantee that that's going to be appropriate for every single undertaking. If I was writing something for 
LNER, let's say, I'm sure I'd write a lot more words than I would write for a heritage railway. If I was writing something for a model engineering club with a five inch gauge railway, I'm sure I'd write less words than I'm writing for a standard gauge railway. It's got to be fit for the purpose of the undertaking that it applies to. But whatever we put in it, that's what we're committing to do. And we must do what we say we're going to do. The SMS works quite well then. If you put in the SMS what you expect everyone to do and you're prepared to enforce that, then it becomes a good mechanism for directors and other people who are ultimately responsible for what goes on in the organization to ensure that activities are controlled safely. Um, it is um, it is often the case when um, I've, I've worked in a number of railways where, where I've helped with SMSs um, to some greater or lesser extent. And when something is not written down, it's very easy for people to well-meaningly make up what they think is the most appropriate um, way forward. But perhaps that person making that decision because they've never been advised of anything else is not the person who would actually be responsible if it goes wrong. It's quite good, I think, that the people who are responsible if there's an incident, the directors and managers of the company, are the people who sign off the SMS. Because then they're saying, this is how I expect the company to be managed and I'm prepared to take responsibility as long as it's managed in this way. I think it works quite well in that respect. And as I mentioned earlier, the SMS will be the thing that's examined after an incident. Uh, I, I, there are, um, uh, you can read them on, online, they're publicly available prohibition notices uh, from the ORR and improvement notices from the ORR issued to all kinds of uh, railway uh, and other guided transport system undertakings and their heritage railways and mainline and infrastructure operators and entities responsible for rolling stock maintenance. And really, really frequently, they don't immediately relate to an incident that took place, but they relate to the factors that led up to the incident, the lack of process that prevented the incident occurring or the lack of adherence to a process um, or the inadequacy of an SMS um, style um, document. The SMS is the thing that, that uh, an investigator will get out the drawer and say, what does your SMS say of how you're managing the risk to stop this incident occurring? and were you actually doing it? Um, and I can't underline enough how important the SMS is after an incident has taken place for establishing the factors that led up to it um, and the direction that the investigation is going to go. Uh, right, so SMS is in general. Uh, before I move on to the drugs and alcohol uh, policy that we've drawn up in particular, I just want to talk a bit about SMS structure. This is just an administrative thing rather than a legal thing, but it's the structure that I'm going to work to when we make these templates. Um, so I think it's important to, to get across uh, what our thought process was uh, before we start. So the first thing is there is no right and wrong way to structure documents in an SMS. On some organizations, they just number them one, two, three, four, five, up to however many there are. On some organizations, they group them into A1, A2, B1, B2, B3. That's absolutely fine. You can do it pretty much however you want. But it is really useful to have a document numbering system so that you can make references between documents, so that you can say, you must do blah, de, blah, de, blah, as shown in document number six or whatever it's going to be. So it's useful to have that and, of course, to put version numbers on the end of them so that people know which version they're looking at. The SMS, in inverted commas, is likely to be more than one document, and I would definitely recommend it is more than one document. There's a bit of sort of nomenclature confusion here. The SMS as a system will be all of the documents that detail how you're going to run the railway safely. But we quite often refer to the SMS as a... 12 or 14 page long cover document that does nothing more than signpost to all the other potentially hundreds of documents that make up the SMS. So there's two things that we're referring to, the SMS as a whole as a system, which is loads of documents, and what I'm gonna be calling the overall document, although it's gonna have the SMS written on the front of it, all of the documents are part of the system of managing safety. They all need to be controlled. They all need to fall into a document numbering system and somebody needs to be responsible for all of them. That doesn't mean the same person has to write all of them, but it means somebody needs to be responsible for them and to issue them and to make sure they don't conflict and to, to work out things like that. 
So the drugs and alcohol policy that we're going to look at in a minute is not going to be pages 103 to 107 of the SMS, one massive document. It's going to be its own little word document, and it's 11 pages long with pictures and things like that. It's part of the SMS. It's part of the system of managing safety. It will be pointed to by another document, the overall document, which will say the company has a policy for the management of drugs and alcohol and it's policy number whatever. So that's, uh, in fact, what I've just described is now up on the screen, an overall document and then sub documents and in fact, most likely sub sub documents. So an overall document, the SMS, the sign pointer document that points to all the other documents and references them by number as to where all the answers can be found. Some things of major policy, health and safety policy. Uh, what else do we have there? Maybe the rule book, things like that. Major items of policy that sit at the very top um, of the tree. And then you might have a subfamily of documents on loco maintenance. And I'll just bring up the next slide because I'm going to be numbering the documents in this way that's shown at the bottom. I'm going to start off with your company initials. So I've put the word hops then a slash SMS so that we know it's the SMS family of documents and then more slashes as we go down more subfamilies. So I'm going to be using C for competence, for example, in this structure that I've built up. Um, and then there'll be document one, document two, document three. And if we wanted to, we could have three slash A, three slash B, but I generally haven't found it necessary to go any deeper than that number of slashes. So uh, my uh, family of SMS sub documents on rules, for example, hop slash SMS slash R for rules, slash one for the rule book, slash two for the signal box instructions, slash three for the electric token block regulations, slash four for whatever the other uh, rule book components that we have that all form part of the SMS um, are going to be. And I've put hops in red because that's another format that I'm going to be using when it's insert your company name here. I'm going to put it in red in the template so that you know ah, that's where I've got to put my company name or the current date or our initials or what the version number is. I'm going to help you out by coloring in uh, in red. So you can start to see how this family of documents is going to build up. Oh, uh, we'll have a miscellaneous at the bottom. And in fact, the drugs and alcohol policy in my fantasy of imagination of how this should all work goes in the miscellaneous section and that's hop slash sms slash z for miscellaneous um, and there'll be a slash one a slash two a slash three and the drugs and alcohol policy is slash three so i've already worked out through my work on on heritage railways and through preparing for this um, uh, workshop this little document structure and where I think all the document numbers uh, should come. But document control is absolutely key. It's not just a case of, say, of deciding what the policy is going to be and then going to the effort of writing it down. Controlling the SMS uh, and versioning the documents that we issue uh, is really key. It builds credibility for the system and for the document as a whole if it's all properly laid out, properly numbered, properly version controlled and stored in one central location, which obviously we're going to say is going to be hops, uh, rather than being emailed around and no document version numbers and all those things. And no one really knows what the most up to date document is or what documents exist and which ones don't. Uh, right, let's just have a quick look at the comments. Oh, sorry, I haven't been paying too much attention to these comments as we're going along. Uh, da, da. Uh, tree structure, Adam Williams from the Dean Forest says, tree structure preferred over flat folder format. Yes, so I agree with that. If we're thinking of the same thing, to have these slashes um, where each slash represents a sub family of documents of the family above rather than just one two three four five six seven eight nine yes i completely agree it's very difficult to insert extra documents in and things like that if you just go one two three four five six seven eight nine um, uh, Adam says the first document he published was the production of documents, giving the basic template and numbering system. Yes, I completely agree. And I have myself published what I jokingly called the policy policy um, when I had my Humphrey Appleby hat on uh, to say uh, the policy of how the policy was going to be controlled and formatted and what size text was going to be used and all those things. I didn't call it the policy policy in the end. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, everyone for those comments. Uh, there's various different uh, document numbering systems being suggested uh, in the comments. So thank you very much for those all looking pretty similar or it looks pretty similar to what I suggested. So that's good. Um, you can obviously have whatever numbering system that you like. 
Right, the next thing that I want to talk about that I think uh, we need to uh, establish and agree on before we get into the SMS is the company structure. Well, here's where we're going to have some difficulty, isn't it? Because everybody's got a different company structure. So what I've done over time is I've formulated a family tree for the company using words deliberately that I don't think are in common use. So that the SMS can be written to those words and then you can have whatever job titles you want on the actual railway in the actual company and equate them to these abstract job titles. Um, it's uh, very similar to, um, for example, saying um, uh, the, the guard in the rule book, the guard. And in the mainline, rail, mainline railway rule book, it refers to the guard all the time. The guard will do this, the guard will do that, the guard will do the other. But lots of different train operating companies call the equivalent of the guard different things. Train manager, conductor, um, supervisor, you know, all these different things. But they all know that even though their job title is conductor or train manager, that as far as the rule book is concerned, they are the guard and they carry out the guard's responsibilities. Uh, another example I've just thought of is the section signal. The rule book will refer to the section signal all over the place. But every signal also has its name and Hopefully, none of the official names are the section signal. The home signal could be the section signal. The starting signal could be the section signal. The advanced starting could be the section signal. They all have their own names, but one of them is carrying out the role of the section signal. So that's what I've tried to do here. So here we go. Here's my uh, family tree of a, of a railway that I like to build SMSs to. There's all the staff on the front line and the signalmen and the guards and the drivers and things like that. And they're all sorted into departments and every department has a department manager. It's totally up to you how you choose to divide them up. Big railways tend to have a diesel department, a steam department, a cafe department, a s and department, all these different departments. Smaller organisations might tend to just have an operations department, which includes drivers and firemen and guards, uh, and a commercial department, which includes tickets and booking offices and shop and cafe. And a lot of it will depend on how many staff you've got. If you've only got three signalmen and two drivers, it's probably not worth separating them into two departments. But if you've got 30 drivers and 40 signalmen, probably want to split them into separate departments and have a department manager. Incidentally, this is only a um, managerial department manager. It doesn't have to be the signalling inspector or the driver's inspector. And in fact, I recommend that the department manager is not the same person as the chief inspector. But I recognise that volunteer numbers are not inexhaustible. And in most cases, that's what, uh, that, that's what, the, what, what actually will happen. So however you choose to divide up your staff, divide them up. Each department gets a department manager. Above the department managers is a phrase which I've called manager of the business unit. And no matter how many times people say to me, oh, railways don't have business units. Well, that's why I picked this term, because it's not something that or I hope it's not something that will get confused with an existing term on a railway. So the key thing about the manager of the business unit is it's just, and in fact, the department manager is it's a single person. It's a person who's nominated to that role. They're not always on duty, but they are always that job. The head of signalman is always the head of signalman, whether he's at home in bed asleep or on duty on the railway. The manager of the business unit. So let's imagine that might be the person in charge of all the infrastructure departments or the person in charge of all the operating departments or the person in charge of all the commercial departments. That's going to be a management role that somebody's appointed to and they are always it, whether they're on duty or not. And above the managers of the business units, everyone, every organization has a slightly different structure at the top, general manager, managing director or a team of directors. So that managing director uh, box may not be there. It may go straight to the uh, directors. Uh, what I've not built, what I've not built is a recognition of there being an engineering director, a commercial director, an operating director, all going down to one general manager and then fanning out again, uh, because that way madness lies. If you have that sort of scenario where your directors have portfolios, then they are fulfilling the roles as far as the SMS is concerned of the manager of the business unit. It doesn't matter. Remember, it doesn't matter whether it's the starting signal or the advanced starting signal, it's still the section signal. It doesn't matter whether somebody's a conductor or a train manager, they're still the guard. It doesn't matter whether somebody is a director, a manager or, or anyone else. Their role will be allocated to a manager of the business unit uh, role. So just to give some examples of how this uh, this might uh, be applied, because I appreciate this is all a bit uh, all a bit mind blowing when you first see it. 
Um, here's a, here's a, here's a made-up uh, railway organisation. So you can see down the bottom some actual realistic railway departments. There's some signalmen and a head of signalmen, some station staff, and you might have a station master for each station, or you might consider all your stations to be one department and have one um, department manager in charge of all of them, patrollers and a head of P-Way, and obviously that you can have as, you can make this as wide as you like, and you can have as many branches coming down as you like. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the levels of management as far as the SMS is concerned, this is what I'd like us to work to. You can see the three left-hand departments, station, signalman and drivers, all report to the operations manager. The operations manager, as far as the SMS is concerned, is going to be the manager of the business unit. And the reason why I'm going on about this is because loads of things in the SMS have to be somebody's responsibility. And the SMS needs to be able to say, blah, 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 you will tell the manager of the business unit. And it doesn't matter whether you're working in the stations department or the P-Way department or the, uh, or the shop department, you'll have a manager of the business unit. If we, did, if we weren't able to say that, we'd have to, in very long hand and with lots of repetition, say, if you're working in the shop, you must tell the commercial manager. If you're working in the P-Way, you must tell the infrastructure manager. If you're working in drivers, you must tell the operations manager. And every time we wanted to move some people around or change what the family tree of the organization was going to look like, we'd have to rewrite all those paragraphs and it would, it would just not work. So by generalizing the roles in this way, it makes the SMS a lot easier to write, a lot easier to keep up to date because it's not necessary to keep changing, changing it every time we change job, um, and a lot easier for people to understand you must tell or you must get permission from the commercial manager. It just so happens that the commercial manager's actual job title is something else. Sorry, I've said that wrong. He must get permission from the manager of the business unit. It just so happens to be that the manager of the business unit for my particular business unit's job title is something else, which is commercial manager. Uh, I'm going to show another example, a slightly different example now, um, where we use the phrase head of in a slightly different way. So I know some railways use head of signalman, head of guards, and some railways consider that head of level to be slightly further up uh, uh, than, than the departments. So in this particular example, the managers of the business units have got the job titles, head of operations, head of infrastructure, head of commercial, and all sorts of other historical job titles have been used down there for the department manager. So you can see how no matter what job titles you want to give people in the organization, it can be modeled onto this manager of the business unit and department manager type uh, scenario. Uh, and as Richard has pointed out in the comments, always pe uh, people's job titles rather than their actual names in the SMS, uh, certainly because otherwise when people change job, the SMS has to be updated. And we all know that people change jobs very, very frequently. We don't want to have to keep changing and reissuing the SMS. But it is important in the job description of the stations inspector in this particular case to make clear that they are responsible for the, the duties of a department manager as far as the SMS is concerned. Or in the previous example, if I go, if I go back a page, uh, to make clear that the commercial manager, um, even though that's their job title, assumes the responsibilities of the manager of the business unit uh, as far as the SMS is concerned. Uh, now, this is all very well, I hear you cry, but uh, you said that the, or I said that the department manager and the manager of the business unit are not always on duty, and a lot of steam railways and a lot of, a lot of hops organizations are not 24 seven, oh, sorry, are um, seven day operations. And we can't expect these managers of the business units and department managers to be on duty or on call the whole time, not least of all because they'd never be able to have a drink. So on a day-to-day -day basis, here's my final slide on company structure. On a day-to-day -day basis, there's all the people down the bottom who've turned up on a Sunday uh, to, to run the railway. The head of department is at home, the manager of the business units work Monday to Friday, you know, all these kind of things. We're not going to have that complete structure in all the time whenever a train is running or whenever somebody's working on the railway. So there's a slightly different day-to-day -day structure. And it's this, this level, which in the SMS I'm calling function supervisor, where the railway in practice and the whole organization in practice is almost certainly grouped together into just bits that work well together. And some sort of duty manager or duty officer on a day to day basis is placed in charge of them. 
So in this particular example, signalmen, station staff, drivers, linemen, patrollers and booking office clerks on a day to day basis will report to the duty officer. If there's a, uh, an issue on a station, it wouldn't be um, reasonable to expect the station staff to ring the head of stations at any time of the day or night and expect to get it sorted out. They ring the duty officer. And the duty officer, who is a broad-minded manager, will have a discussion with those people and reach a sensible risk-based conclusion about what we're going to do. And then almost certainly one or the other will refer it to the department manager for some sort of long-term uh, fix. And some organizations have one duty manager that's responsible for everything on the day, excuse me, uh, and some divided up a little bit. Again, it depends on the, the magnitude of your organization. So in the example, I've got one duty officer responsible there for all the sort of railway -y type activities that are going on on a particular day, and then a separate duty manager in the shop. And that's just the way I've chosen to structure my company. Um, you can structure it however you like because of this um, act of generalizing the role to say the function supervisor will do this. It doesn't matter whether you call your function supervisor for uh, for the for the signalman, the duty officer, the duty manager, the duty operations officer, uh, the responsible officer, any of those things. Uh, the SMS will say function supervisor. And then it doesn't matter which of the functions that you work in, you'll always have a function supervisor. In the example, uh, again, if I'm sales staff and I'm told you must get permission from the function supervisor, I'll know, oh, my function supervisor is the shop duty manager. Whereas if I'm a driver, I'll know it's the duty officer. So it's not, as we know, it's not 100% straightforward, this management structure on railways. The line manager responsibilities uh, and, and reporting lines is often a little bit different to the day-to-day -day supervision uh, lines of reporting. I've put at the top here a on-call manager. Everyone has a slightly different who's above the duty officer. I know the whole point of the duty officer or the manager of the day is that they're the top dog on the day, but you've got to give them somewhere to go higher. And it may just be that um, if the duty officer comes from the commercial discipline, they just ring up the commercial manager at home and because it's such a rare thing, that is a reasonable thing to do. Um, or if the duty officer has to, happens to come from an engineering background, their boss might in practice be the engineering manager and they ring the engineering manager at home and say, I've got this problem, what do you think I should do? And again, because it's probably something that happens very rarely, it's probably, <clears throat> excuse me, it's probably acceptable uh, based on the risk to have that as the official process. Um, or of course, as per what's on the screen, you might have an on-call manager, which could be any number of the directors or senior managers, or maybe it's the managers of the business units all take turns on a roster or something like that, so that there's some sort of escalation uh, process uh, available to somebody that eventually will be responsible in the case of a serious incident. Um, the function supervisor, crucially, uh, can be a shift role. Uh, it's not somebody who is appointed and that is their job and no one else is that job. The duty officer could be a different person every day. The shop duty manager could be a different person every day. But I'm going to work on the basis that if there's any activity going on in a particular function of the railway, like signalman, there will be a function supervisor. There will be somebody who that signalman can go to on the day to say this is a problem that's arisen or this is a safety issue that needs to be dealt with or this is something that's in the SMS. If there's nobody in the shop and it's all locked up, obviously there doesn't need to be a function supervisor, there doesn't need to be a shop duty manager. But if there's somebody in the shop doing work, somebody needs to be the function supervisor. There's nothing to stop you having um, uh, 20 shop duty managers and there's nothing to stop you saying that um, there can be different levels of competence of a shop duty manager. There can be ones that are only allowed to be shop duty managers on days when the shop is closed and you're stocking shelves and things like that. But it's ne nevertheless somebody to be in charge of safety of what's going on. And then you can have a smaller subset of shop duty managers who are allowed to be the duty manager when the shop is open to the public. But somebody, crucially, has to be uh, responsible. There has to be some sort of line of reporting uh, for what's going on. Um, so, and if that's applied pragmatically, it doesn't have to be the case that anything that I'm saying now should stop you doing something that you're already doing. Um, if you already have made a conscious decision that what you're doing is safe and is controlled and is appropriate. You might say, oh yeah, but 
Barbara comes in on a Thursday and stocks the shelves and there's nobody else in the shop. Well, that's absolutely OK. Make sure Barbara is competent to be a function supervisor, that she knows how safety is supposed to be managed in the shop. She knows how to lock the door and she knows how to go to the fire assembly point and all of those things. Because if you're not doing those things, then that person coming in on a Thursday and, and working in the shop all on their own, stocking the shelves, their safety is not actually being managed. So there will always be, and according to the wonderful SMS that we're all going to be working towards, there will always be a function supervisor if work is going on uh, in, in that section of the family tree. Um, right, so it's not really very easy to get all of that onto one family tree because obviously there's two ways to go up the uh, up the flow chart, but, uh, but that's the best I can do uh, to try and put them in together to make clear that those people on the front line, they have their lines of reporting all the way up to the top, but on a day-to-day -day basis, there'll be some sort of function supervisor, duty officer or duty manager or whatever that they report to on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Right, so let's, after all that, move over to our uh, Word documents now that I've finished talking about uh, SMSs in general. But I thought it was important to sort of lay the land for, uh, for, for what we expect and how the workshops might, uh, uh, might continue. So here's my template drugs and alcohol policy uh, for our uh, template uh, SMS. And this is the document that uh, eventually, uh, when the comments after this video have all come in and we've done any other amendments that we need to, that will be shared with advanced HOPS members uh, so that you can pick it apart if you want to, plagiarize whatever bits you like and don't like, uh, and, and use it um, if you wish to. And what obviously I hope is that you'll look at it and you'll go, yep, yeah, that's got the best practice of everything we had before and everything that uh, other railways have put in, and, uh, and that's what we want to use. Just before I get into reading uh, reading through and giving you the rationale of why we've written what we've written. I'm just going to go up the document a little bit. Here's a nice cover page. Uh, and you'll see that I've left uh, where it's time to write your company name in. I've left it in red. And where it's time to insert your logo, uh, I've written it there. Of course, there's absolutely nothing that says you have to stick to this format. It's just a format that I've found works quite well over the years. Uh, and you're welcome uh, to use it uh, or not use it uh, if you don't. Um, if you're pretty um uh, if you feel the format is, is pretty arbitrary and you're happy to use it or not use it then i would recommend obviously using it because all the subsequent reviews and re-editions of all these template documents that come out will be in this format and it may be that you say well we're not going to use that hops format for now we'll wait until 50 percent of the sms is converted over to the template format and then we'll start using the template uh, format or whatever because i do understand that you don't necessarily want 50 SMS documents in your current uh, format and then one HOPS one in a, in a HOPS format. Remember, everywhere that there, everywhere that's in red uh, is where I'm expecting you to write in your own uh, company initials or uh, whatever, whatever it is, whoops, whatever it is that you want to do uh, to, to number your own documents. And furthermore, above that, there's a cover page which is designed for you to completely delete it makes clear to anyone who finds it in your organization looking for SMS documents that this is not your organization's SMS. So that they shouldn't uh, think, oh, brilliant, I found the SMS drugs and alcohol policy, perhaps not recognizing that this is a template or that there's many other railways that will all have them. Especially since in new hops, there's a search box so people can search for things and find them. Uh, it details a bit about how the template works. I recommend that if you do use the template, you use track changes in Microsoft Word and keep the track changed version separately from the final version that you're going to publish, obviously as a PDF, because then if, a, um, if an update is published to the HOPS template, you will be able to see where you made changes last time and either make them again to the to the updated version or copy the changes from the updated version into your version. But it just makes it a lot easier so you don't lose what you've changed uh, in the template. Uh, there's a bit about copyright and things like that. You're allowed to use it if you're an advanced TOPS member as much as you like, but you're not allowed to redistribute it or uh, commercially use it or rehost it elsewhere. And that front page is designed to be entirely deleted uh, once you get it. Uh, I've just put that on there to make sure everyone understands what's going on. Right, so 
Let's go through this now then. Uh, let's go through the template drugs and alcohol policy, the best I've managed to come up with through talking to everyone or talking to a lot of people. But I am sure that you will all come up with a lot of comments uh, as a result of this. And you can either make them now or you can send them to me afterwards. Uh, and I will uh, do my best to include all the best practice. So first of all, in the introduction, I always find it's a good idea to start SMS documents off with a summary of why we're here and why it's necessary to have an SMS document um, uh, telling everyone to, what to do um, in this particular case. So in the case of drugs and alcohol, the company has a legal and moral duty to protect the health and safety and well-being of its staff and passengers and visitors and all others with whom it interacts. This is a requirement of the Health and Safety at Work Act and the Transport and Works Act. So in the top there, a nice headline about what laws we're trying to comply with. It notes that the Health and Safety at Work Act also places legal responsibilities on everybody, on all the staff coming to work to take care of their own and others' safety and to engage with the company in doing so. So there's no excuse for not A, following this policy or B, engaging with a company in its uh, enacting of it. Uh, just in order to um, sort of cut to the chase for anybody that's only going to read the first paragraph, there's a bit there about uh, what can happen if somebody reports uh, for work unfit for duty due to the effects of drugs or alcohol. Um, and although the rest of the document is going to talk in quite some length about what those are, I find it's helpful to have it here in the introduction. Uh, it says many drugs can also have psychological effects that affect performance or mental well-being, especially after long-term use or if a dependency develops. And that understanding, excuse me, understanding the signs and consequences and our policy in addressing them helps us all to manage the potential consequent risks to health and safety. So it wraps up there why we're here and why we're having this discussion. And as the company has a legal responsibility to do this, I always find it's helpful to be very explicit and say this policy is how we are complying with that particular uh, rule or law. Here's an extract from a document published by the ORR called Fitness to Work, which was published in December 2017, where they paraphrase the Transport and Works Act 1992. Um, it stipulates that anyone involved in a train movement or maintenance or repair or alteration will be guilty of an offence if they are unfit to carry out work through the use of drink or drugs. It also states that the company itself, the operator, commits an offence if somebody, if one of its staff turns up um, for work unfit due to uh, drink or drugs, unless the company has exercised all due diligence to prevent that offence taking place. And it explicitly says that the existence of a drugs and alcohol policy can be used by an employer to demonstrate it has taken steps to prevent the commission of such an offence by its employees. As always, employees includes volunteers, staff includes volunteers, employee, employers uh, includes anybody uh, commissioning the work of volunteers. It doesn't matter whether people are paid or not in this respect. So a little helpful uh, in a box there because it's a uh, because it's a quote from a from another document and because I've quoted from another document there I'm just going to zip all the way to the end of this procedure here is my references section where I reference all the research materials that I uh, used and that's not so that you can see what I used that's so that your SMS records the documents uh, that you used. And I would also always recommend that you have a little folder on your computer where you keep a copy of the um, documents that, uh, that you used that, that led you to get to the conclusions that you did in, in writing the policy. So there's all mine. So let's go back up. OK, part two, some general overviews, the do's and don'ts. Uh, uh, staff must not report for duty under the influence of drugs or alcohol, consume alcohol or drugs on duty, or bring onto company premises any drugs of abuse. So they're my three headline things that I want to prevent by means of this drugs and alcohol policy. Then there's a thing about what in, is included in the term drugs, and we have to be really careful here, of course, because not all drugs are illegal. Um, not all drugs are um, inappropriate for use on a railway because if they don't cause drowsiness and they don't have uh, restrictions and side effects and things like that, then there's no problem with somebody working on a railway. Um, but we have to get to the bottom of which ones we can and which ones we can't and in what circumstances people can and can't work and in what circumstances people have broken the law and, and, and when they haven't. Uh, we also give a definition here to the term influence, 
Um, and this always uh, causes a lot of uh, discussion, I tend to find. So first of all, any amount of any illegal drug or medication, any amount of any drug or medication that has been legally prescribed or bought, but not correctly declared in accordance with this policy and the, auth uh, and the individual authorized to continue working. So in a minute, we're going to get to the paragraph that explains what staff should do if they're on legitimate legal prescribed medication and how that's going to get managed. And if that part of the process has not been followed, their influence is not legitimate. Then there's uh, three paragraphs, three bullet points to do with alcohol. And those uh, limitations on alcohol are more restrictive than the limitations for drink driving. They are copied from the RSSB, the Railway Safety and Standards Board's uh, definitions. And the discussion has been had many times. Should we use these more restrictive ones? Should we use the, um, uh, the, the drink driving ones? Well, you tell me, perhaps in the comments, whether you think the Transport and Works Act uh, defines these super strict um, uh, alcohol limits or whether you think it uh, defines the, the less strict uh, limits. You let me know in the comments and I'll tell you the answer uh, in a minute. But it's important to be mathematical about this. It's important to say this many milligrams in 100 milliliters of blood, because what we're eventually going to say here is somebody is either guilty or they're not. They've committed an offense or they haven't, not just internally in the railway, but potentially legally um, in terms of compliance with the law and not just them, but the company as well. So we owe it to our to our staff to specify in numbers what the uh, what the limits are. Uh, OK, we'll come back to that uh, in just a second while we go down to this next paragraph, application of policy. Uh, and again, something that comes up in discussion quite a lot is, does the policy apply to non-safety critical staff? And I always say, yes, it does. Apply the policy across the board and then there really is no, uh, no opportunity for any ambiguity as to whether it applies to me or not. Um, it is an offence for safety critical members of staff to be uh, an infringement of these uh, these drug and alcohol limits and it is an infringement for, for managers not to show diligence to prevent that happening. It's not such a criminal offence for non-safety critical staff but I always recommend um, uh, saying that the policy applies uh, across the board. Um, Ernest uh, has answered my question, although uh, uh, perhaps I should have banned him from it because I did discuss it with him in the course of constructing this workshop. But yes, surprisingly, the Transport and Works Act defines the less restrictive drink drive uh, road uh, limit for alcohol. But the Rail Safety and Standards Board provides the more strict limit. Heritage Railways are not um, uh, required to follow absolutely everything the Railway Safety and Standards Board says. So legally, the limit for railways, for Heritage Railways that is, would be what's in the Transport and Works Act. But remember, the SMS is designed to mitigate risk. And there are many risks associated with drugs and alcohol policy. And one of the many, many risks, and probably one quite low down the tree, but the one that I refer to in this case, is the PR risk. Because if an incident occurs on a railway and that person is um, not so drunk as to bust the, um, the railway limit, uh, but they, sorry, I've got this the wrong way around. They are so drunk as to bust the railway limit, but not so drunk as to bust the road limit. And your policy says the road limit, and they're in that sort of bit in between. Then there's all sorts of PR headlines to be written to say such and such a railway allows drunk drivers to drive the train, or you know deliberately misleading headlines like that. If a person managed to get it between the two, so they were perfectly compliant with the policy, and there was an incident. So if nothing else but to manage that PR risk. Let's have the railway limit that mainline railways work to, and then there can be no opportunity for uh, that um, unfortunate circumstance to arise where a person is between the two limits uh, and an incident occurs. Uh, so that's why I always say railway limit. It obviously is also easy to demonstrate that you've copied what the RSSB have said, and we are all railways after all. Much more difficult to justify why we haven't copied what the RSSB have said, and we've gone for the drink drive limit uh, instead.
Uh, right, so application of policy was specifying that the policy applies for everybody. I have uh, managed to, well, I didn't find them, to be honest, but somebody did point them out to me and I thought, yep, that's a very fair point. A couple of extremely minor uh, exceptions, and we'll come on to those later. Uh, in fact, we'll come on to them now. I'll zip down the document and show you. So, yes, I am now sort of going back on myself. The, the drugs and alcohol policy needs to apply to everyone in the organization, but in extremely tiny letters underneath, in extremely tiny letters, wine waiters, bar managers at beer festivals, things like that, where there is a legitimate, justifiable need for those people to sample alcohol uh, while they're on duty. Obviously, they're not going to be carrying out any safety critical uh, roles and the exemptions should definitely not uh, extend to anyone in a safety critical position. But you notice here, the first instance of, uh, of, of the example that I gave, we refer to the manager of the business unit. It enables the SMS to be really simple. It doesn't matter whether you're in operations or commercial or um, infrastructure or engineering or any of these things. You will have a manager of the business unit and it could be four or five different people, depending on what part of the company you're from. But you go to the one that's applicable to you. And that saved the SMS there from having to write um, the exemptions must be authorized in writing by the engineering manager slash operations manager slash infrastructure manager slash commercial manager. And then we have to come back and change the SMS every time we change those positions around. This is a good example of this manager of the business unit terminology being used to make things simpler. So back up to where we were. So application of policy. I think we've finished with that now. I always find it's uh, helpful to write a little uh, source thing there. Sometimes it's easier to write them in a separate document, especially if there's lots of them or to write them at the end. But if it's just a little one line, I like that. It's as easy as anything just to write them next to the paragraph they apply to. And so that's what I quite often do. Remember, as I said right at the start, I'm not saying you must do any of this. I'm just saying this is one way I found to crack the nut and you're welcome to copy it. Little thing about signing on for duty, that staff when they're signing on for duty are uh, confirming they're not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Now, hopefully you're beginning to see my sort of SMS style. I've picked every headline and then I write a couple of little paragraphs about every headline. So when I started writing this policy, I had a little brainstorm and I came up with all the headlines. I thought, right, what do we need? Well, we need an introduction to say why we're doing it. We need a thing to say who it applies to. Oh, signing on for duty. That's a good idea. Yep, let's have a little thing in there about it. And I have a little brainstorm with myself or with the other people that are involved, um, depending on the circumstances. And, uh, and I write out all these headlines and then I fluff everyone out with a paragraph to explain what our policy is, how we're going to manage this particular aspect of whatever the policy is, how we're going to manage signing on for duty with relation to drugs and alcohol. And I write it as a paragraph. And sometimes I write a paragraph and then I write another paragraph and I think, oh, I, they're, they're exactly the same. I can combine them together. Or sometimes I write a paragraph and I think, oh, my goodness, there's so much more to this than I thought. Maybe I need to go 3.1, 3.2. Uh, or, or maybe I need three, four and five, whatever it is. That's the sort of mechanism that I use to construct an SMS. So on to part five, drugs and alcohol screening. The company may initiate drugs and or alcohol screening to be carried out by an independent agency because it's the easiest way to do it on a member of staff in the circumstances shown on the following pages. The Function Supervisor's Manual Procedure 3 applies and I'll come back to this in a minute. Remember I said the SMS doesn't have to be, and I don't think wants to be, one 2,000 page long document. It wants to be little nuggets of subject matter uh, documents that apply to each thing. And this is our drugs and alcohol policy. Separately, I have written in the past a procedure for the function supervisor, but nobody else, in how they manage drugs and alcohol screening. So it doesn't have to be taking up more space in the drugs and alcohol SMS policy and making even more pages that people aren't going to read. It's left the drugs and alcohol policy to be what applies to everybody and the function supervisor's responsibilities, because there's quite a lot of them in drugs and alcohol screening, have been farmed out into another sub document. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. In fact, just to tantalize you, there it is. Uh, so reasons why we might do drugs and alcohol screening or uh, uh, that we uh, reserve the rights, let's say, to do drugs and alcohol screening pre-appointment. I don't know many heritage railways that do pre-appointment drugs and alcohol screening, but if we have it in the policy, it's something that we can uh, then uh, exercise the procedure for doing. And it's up to you uh, how you um, 
uh, determine whether or not pre-appointment drugs and alcohol screening will be required and if so, who it's required um, for. So not much meat on the bones on pre-appointment. Random 5.2, the company will conduct random unannounced screenings. Now, I don't know, and perhaps you can tell me in the comments, um, uh, I don't know that there's any law that says you have to do this. If there is, you can tell me where it is in the comments and I'll update this to show it. But what I do know is, having been involved in Railway X and having spoken on behalf of that railway with regulatory authorities, that we got asked the question, what's our drugs and alcohol policy? And we got it out the folder and we handed it over. And we were asked, do you conduct random screenings? And we said, well, we reserve the right to, but we've probably never done it. And uh, it was recommended you should do a random screening. If nothing else, just to make sure that people recognize that it is something that can happen and that if there's an incident, there will be screening, something that we're not afraid to do. And it's not about frightening people. It's about um, engaging with the SMS, doing what it says and making it almost not confrontational for people on the day that it happens because it's just part of the norm. And on this particular railway, the senior managers sort of looked at each other in horror and said, oh, my goodness me, there will be an outcry if we do random drugs and alcohol screening just because of the, the culture on the railway. Um, uh, many other SMS processes took place. And a few months later, uh, random drugs and alcohol screening van turned up. Four names were picked out of the hat. They were all randomly screened and nobody complained because of the pre-work that had been done to advise people that random screening can take place because a poster went up on the um, uh, on the notice board and the poster is here in the policy. Oh, it's a bit big for the screen. There's the poster. Um, and, and nobody got upset and it showed real good safety maturity development that uh, we went from a stage or that railway went from a stage where random screening would have been received extremely negatively to where everyone said, oh, brilliant, the SMS. Yeah, we went on our briefing for that. It's actually happening. This is good. We know where we stand. And I always find that especially volunteers on a heritage railway like to know where they stand, like to have a policy that's being followed and like to know what's going on. So random screening turned into a really positive thing uh, for that particular railway. So based on the risk, I've said here that at least one unannounced screening of at least four members of staff will take place every three years. I thought that was a reasonably frequent, uh, reasonable frequency and reasonable number of people um, to do. And also, uh, I'm sorry, and my, my key deciding factor in that frequency was enough to keep it in people's mind, enough that we don't get such a great turnover of staff that no one can ever remember it previously happening. Enough to just make sure that at the back of people's minds when they're in the pub having a drink and they're thinking, shall I have another one or not? They think, oh, well, even if I don't have an incident, I could get randomly done. Um, and it helped. It helped a lot. Like everything, it's about how you approach it and how you put it across and how you take people with you. Um, but it, it really did um, improve things here. So if you're not already doing random screenings, I recommend if you adopt this as part of your policy uh, that you do it. Uh, now on random screenings, and this follows the sort of mainline protocol, uh, provided the breath test is clear, because when you do a random drugs or when you do a drugs and alcohol screening, you get the van out, you do the breathalyzer test, that, the result of that is available immediately. The urine test takes a few days to come back and the breath test is generally for alcohol and the urine test is generally for drugs. But if it's a random one on the mainline railway and everywhere that I've seen, the person concerned can go straight back to work as long as they're happy to without having to wait for the results. Because it was a random one, there's no allegation, there's no incident, there's no suspicion on that person. It just happened to be that their name was pulled out of the hat. Um, now, uh, when you get the results from a screening, you'll always get a sort of a receipt, uh, one that you keep at the time. We'll come on to this in a second and one that comes with the uh, with the results. And that obviously is um, is data about a person and needs to be properly controlled. And where is the place that we always put data about people on our railway that we need to be properly controlled? Obviously, we put it in hop. So there's part of the policy written with the expectation that you're if you're interested enough in hops's sms template you're probably a hops user and it details there in the policy where to put it 
Okay, 5.3 on suspicion. Oh, and thank you very much for the comments, by the way. Uh, there is no law for random, but it is best practice to illustrate due diligence. Yes, exactly. And remember what well, that was? Was it section 28 of the um, uh, Transport and Works Act? Uh, section 28, yes. Um, in fact, hang on, it's down here at the end. Uh, 28 requirement of employer to apply due diligence. Yes, it's a good way for you to demonstrate that we were doing everything possible to um, uh, to enforce and engage people with our drugs and alcohol policy. Uh, so we're not guilty of an offence. Um, and Ernest has pointed out that um, it is a oh, sorry, I've lost the comment. Um, it is a requirement for mainline operators. Like, oh, it is stipulated to mainline operators to carry out a certain percentage of testing. Okay, I don't know who it's stipulated by, but uh, it all helps, doesn't it? It all helps if we can say we're doing it, we can demonstrate our, our diligence and how important we think safety is on the railway by doing these things, even if we might think they're a little bit um, uncomfortable. Um, and it helps as uh, Kai Ernest is making loads of comments. Thanks, Ernest. Um, it helps to demonstrate a sort of strong safety culture and drive home the seriousness of what we are doing of operating a railway. Yes, exactly right. Thank you very much to Liz, who has commented, we have an Alco meter. Yes, you can pick these up, can't you? You can get them from Halfords or wherever, uh, and you can keep it in the office. Um, and again, I've seen a railway that had one in the office, and they said, anyone can come in at any time and use the breathalyzer machine in complete privacy and we won't know what the results are in order to help people know um, uh, well, I guess where their own limit is. Now obviously don't come in expecting to drive the train and then at 10 o'clock ask if you can use the, <laughs> the breathalyzer machine because if it comes out positive then um, you're, you're in a bit of trouble. Uh, but uh, having the machine available and certainly on railways where people stay overnight and things like that, again, I, I completely agree. I found it, it really helps that people go, oh, I wonder if, I wonder if if I was going to drive the train, would I be able to do it? And it really helps people to get to know themselves. Um, Oh, Liz has said that uh, they have in-house trained operators um, for using the machine. Oh, for official purposes. OK, that's absolutely fine. Everything I said a second ago still stands as well. Uh, but thank you very much, Liz, uh, for pointing that out. Yes. So not all railways, of course, will be able to have um, all the equipment or all the people who uh, can do it. Um, uh, but if you do, then that's brilliant. And your SMS will reflect that. Uh, Adam has pointed out that somebody who blew positive but actually had uncontrolled diabetes not picked up by a medical. OK, well, all of these uh, things are subject to uh, reasonableness, aren't they? Now, if a person blew positive on the day and nobody knew they had diabetes, you would have to apply the policy as it was and take them off duty and blah, blah, blah. But then if it subsequently becomes apparent that something like that is happening, then obviously there's no need to proceed to the disciplinary and, and all that other stuff. Um, obviously, we can't cope with uh, or we can't prescribe uh, every single set of circumstances. We only and we're only required to do what's reasonably practicable. And for those of you that are playing hops, workshop, bingo, thank you very much. I've just said the word practicable, which I was trying my best not to say because I know you're waiting for it. Uh, but anyway, yes, so I've blown that one now. So, yeah, we're only required to do what's reasonably practicable. We can't uh, write a... Um, a policy that copes with absolutely everything. Thanks very much for all those comments. So on suspicion, 5.3. There's only four of these, by the way. We're on three already. So what have we had so far? Pre-appointment, random and on suspicion. If it is suspected that a member of staff may be on duty or attempting to report for duty in contravention of the policy, the function supervisor, remember, because that's the person on the day who is um, you know, supervising, or higher level manager. If it happens to be a day when the uh, department manager or the manager of the business unit or the managing director or anyone like that, anyone higher than the function supervisor is around will be informed of the circumstances and determine whether sufficient evidence exists for suspicion. And where suspicion exists, screening must be arranged. Now, just to make clear the intent of that paragraph, this is not the function supervisor will determine whether uh, screening must be arranged. It's the function supervisor will determine the circumstances of the suspicion. If there is suspicion, it must go to screening. 
the reason to have this safeguard here is so that you can't have somebody say, oh, yeah, I, I smelt a bit of alcohol on him. And then the company is uh, required under its SMS policy to arrange the screening and everything else. And there is expense to screening. We don't want to be doing it unless we absolutely uh, or, or sorry, unless it's appropriate to uh, to do. And then two minutes later, that same person says, oh, now I've smelt alcohol on that person over there. And we have to go through the whole process again. There's got to be some control here to stop it being used vexatiously. So it's not the function supervisor says, oh, yes, we can smell alcohol on him, but I'm not going to do the screening. That's not an allowable outcome. It's the function supervisor that says, tell me the circumstances of your suspicion and I will decide whether or not the company is suspicious. Or maybe I'll go and talk to the person and make my own judgment. But it's a safeguard to stop the process being used vexatiously. It's not an opportunity for the function supervisor or anyone else to say, yep, we are suspicious about that person, but we're not going to do the drug test. Um, the member of staff must submit to testing. That's the same on all of them, that once the company has decided that you're going to be tested, you must be tested. It's something that you um, will sign up to when you agree to work for the company in the first place, um, that whatever the reason, and it could just be random, that you will submit to testing. The member of staff must be relieved from duty and not resume any work for the company until the results are received, which remember the breathalyzer thing comes immediately, but the urine takes a few days. So it might be two or three or four days even before the uh, the person can go back on duty. And that might not be um, you know, very friendly, but if there is that suspicion, then we need to uh, be able to demonstrate that we're reacting to it accordingly. And the circumstances of the suspicion and the screening results, as usual, should be recorded on the personnel's on the person's personnel file document uploaded to HOPS, where we keep all uh, uh, data about our employees. Of course, uh, just to reiterate once again, I cannot say you must do this. I'm only saying this is my sort of my suggestion. This is one way that I believe is a good way to crack a nut. So if you don't like any of it. And if you don't want to keep it in hops, you can just delete those words and they won't be there anymore. The following table shows some of the conduct, behavioural and physical symptoms of a person under the influence of drugs or alcohol, which may give rise to suspicion. This is to help the function supervisor or anyone else involved in what amounts to accusing a person and being suspicious of a person. It's not saying this is an exhaustive list. It's just giving some pointers as to... Uh, what we consider to be uh, symptoms that give rise to suspicion. It helps the uh, function supervisor not be accused of just victimizing that person. And similarly, a list of uh, drug specific symptoms which may give rise to suspicion for different types of drugs. This has all come, see the source there, this has all come out of the RSSB's uh, document, which is freely available on the internet. I haven't uh, um, <clears throat> used any any private documents or anything you can find these just by searching in Google uh, and I thought they would be useful to have in here right finally <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> I'm suffering a bit the post incident for cause screening and this if we're honest is the one that's probably uh, the one that uh, creates the most uh, interest so the company may conduct screenings following an incident or accident or near miss. The flow chart must be followed to determine whether screening should take place. I wonder if I can get it all on the screen. Yep, there we go. Uh, there we go, all on the screen. And this is drawn again from RSSB documentation, uh, from information that um, uh, was published by trades unions. Um, and slightly scaled down a little bit to be appropriate for the risk involved in a heritage railway um, environment. It used to be the case um, that if you were involved in an incident, you would get medi-screened. But that's not the case anymore, um, certainly not on the main line. Um, it's a potentially unnecessary expense to go through the, the screening uh, procedure. It's certainly collecting personal data about people which we need a legitimate um, interest uh, to collect and process. So this is my uh, flowchart that I've come up with. First of all, is the incident or accident likely to lead to a public inquiry or is it reportable to the RAIB under Schedule 1 of the reporting requirements? What Schedule 1 of the reporting requirements? Have I got it here? Yes, I have. And this is designed to weed out the, let's call them the really serious incidents from the, um, I don't want to call, oh, what's going on here? Oh, no. 
there we go. The really serious uh, incidents uh, where we feel that somebody should be medi-screened from the rest. And we thought, well, who do we know that's already invented a list of really serious incidents from the rest? The REIB. So we decided just to copy the REIB's um, uh, list. We haven't copied it, we've referred to it if they change their list by extension our SMS updates. So anything involving deaths to staff or passengers or members of the public caused in accidents involving moving trains, serious injuries to two or more staff or passengers or members of the public involving moving trains, level crossing accidents involving death or serious injury except for suicide or trespass, Collisions between rolling stock other than in a siding which cause damage to vehicles involved. Derailments on running lines open to traffic or which block running lines to traffic. Collisions of rolling stock with buffer stops or other automatic devices other than in sidings. Release of fires and dangerous gases and radioactive material. I don't think any railways uh, convey radioactive material, any heritage railways. Um, accidents leading to the closure of a route for more than six hours, except whether related or in excess of two million euros worth of damage to trains. They're the ones that we said were sufficiently serious, copying the mainline example, because that's the mainline example, is ones that really serious, you're straight uh, onto the do do a screening. Separate from the ones that don't. Things like um, uh, collisions with objects other than animals or placed on the railway by vandals or tram tracks, which would not otherwise have required reporting. So this is Schedule 2. Things that we're not saying we go immediately to screening for. Uh, incidents involving road vehicles fouling running lines, failures of tyres and wheels, train fires, signals passed at danger, all of those sorts of things. We're not saying never screen. Right, I think I'm back. Apologies everybody there. It went to broadcast interrupted, but I think I might be back. Hopefully the same video carried on running rather than stopping and requiring everyone to rejoin, but I'll just give it a second for anybody who lost us there. So apologies for that, I don't know what happened there. I'm on a proper decent internet connection and everything now. So um, I'm hoping that we won't have too many problems like that. Okay, so hopefully I was still online when um, I said about the REIB. Uh, can you just let me know in the comments, please, if you don't mind whether I'm uh, back or not, because I'm a bit concerned that I'm not back. Mm -hmm. I'm stopping him. I'm stopping him. Oh, what's going on? Right, I think I'm back. Let me know if I'm not. <laughs> Let me know if I'm not. You're back. Okay, thanks everyone for all those comments. That's brilliant. It takes a good 20 seconds or so after you've posted it before I uh, before I get it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to here. There we go. Uh, right, so that's... Uh, sorry, hopefully uh, I was still there when I was talking about the um, public inquiry reportable under RAIB... Oh dear. Right, looks like we're back again. Sorry about that. I do not know what's going on here, but I shall persevere and uh, see how we get on. Right, back maybe. Yes, Adrian, yeah, I'm back maybe. Right, okay. Are there reasonable grounds to suspect that the person may have contributed to the incident? This is just going to have to be a management decision that somebody makes, probably the function supervisor, and that we eventually uh, live or die by. If it's a spad and we can't immediately write it off as not the driver's fault, then we're probably going to say there's reasonable grounds to suspect the person contributed to the incident. If it's a derailment and it looks like the points have moved under the train and we can't immediately explain why, it's possible that the signalman might have been contributing to the incident. Or if there was an S&T technician in the relay room at the time, there is a possibility. You've got to just apply some uh, uh, a management decision and see what you come out with. So first of all, if there is, yes, uh, reasonable grounds to suspect the person has contributed to the incident, is there reason to suspect that the person may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, showing any of the signs of suspicion detailed in the policy above? And if no, we do not conduct screening. 
And again, that is uh, following the policy, the, 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 the current policy from the main line. It used to be the case that if there were reasonable grounds to suspect the person was involved and you went down, yes, it would go immediately to screening. But now that's not the case. So I suggest we follow that, that it's only necessary to initiate screening if there is reasonable grounds to suspect the person and there is reasonable, uh, sorry, there is reason to suspect the person may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, such as showing any of the signs of suspicion detailed in the policy. Uh, I'm really sorry if you're uh, having problems here. Adam Williams says hit F5 and I'm back, so maybe that's the solution. If you hit F5 to refresh your page, it might come back. Right, going back up to are there reasonable grounds to suspect the person has contributed to the incident? No. We'll give the member of staff an opportunity to specifically request that they're screened, in which case it goes to initiate screening. And that could be for any number of reasons that the member of staff wants to be screened or wants to um, uh, reduce the possibility that uh, anyone could allege anything. Um, but if no, is the individual on an increased monitoring regime to a previous drugs and our related issue? If yes, then go straight to screening. And if no, then do not conduct screening. So I'll be really interested to hear your views on that flow chart. Uh, but that's the best I could come up with through research for what goes on on the main line and applying it um, appropriately to the risk of a heritage railway. Right. The function supervisor because he's the person there on the day, or hire manager, if they happen to be there, will make the arrangements for screening, the person must submit to the test, the person must be relieved from duty and not resume work until the results are received. The circumstances uh, of the incident and the screening results will be put in the near misses and incidents register on hops. Again, that's where I would like you to put it, but if you use some other lesser system, then you can obviously change that part of the SMS. There's a thing here to say that all staff must remain on site unless requiring urgent medical attention or hospital treatment and must comply with the demands of the screening process. Um, and that if a member of staff does go to hospital, then obviously they can go to hospital and uh, the company will take second place to the uh, recommendations of the doctor uh, giving permission. So that's my four occasions, pre-appointment, random, suspicion and post-incident. Please let me know your views either in the comments or afterwards if you prefer. So on to the last little bits then, screening discipline. The company will regard refusal by a member of staff to a reasonable request to be tested for drugs and alcohol to be the same as if that member of staff had tested positive for drugs and alcohol. Pretty straightforward. Again, you'll notice I'm using the word company here. I'm not using trust or railway or um, museum or anything like that. I'm using company so that it works for everybody. And I always, I've put a capital C on company because it's an old fashioned putting a capital C on company and a capital letter on job titles and things like that. So I thought that was quite a nice touch considering that we're all heritage organizations. If the police turn up and uh, want to uh, medi-screen somebody, then that's absolutely fine. I don't think we're gonna stand in the way of that, but we still need to do our own medi-screening as well. It can't be them instead of us. And that's because in general, the police will only test to that Transport and Works Act level, which as you correctly identified is the driving level, the, the higher level, which somebody could show clear on, but still be over the railway level. So if the policy says we're going to do it, we're going to do it. If the police want to do it as well, that's absolutely fine, but that's not going to reduce um, uh, the fact that we're going to do it as well in accordance with our drugs and alcohol policy. Briefing and awareness, how will staff be aware of this policy and how will they engage with it? Well, I think most, and I hope all, but I think it's most organizations now um, of the like are going to be using HOPS, uh, do some sort of induction, some sort of SMS briefing, some sort of basic railway safety. You all call it different things, but it amounts to the same thing. And the drugs and alcohol policy needs to be in there. So here it is in the drugs and alcohol policy where it says this will be part of induction when first joining the company. It's also displayed at signing on points and it's available to download from wherever you keep your safety management system. Okay, on to some last bits then. People on existing medication. Obviously, we have to allow for this, but we still have to manage the uh, safety of the uh, railway. So uh, members of staff on medication should declare this to the manager of the business unit. 
So again, we've used this generic job title so that we don't have to write different job titles that people actually have in the SMS. Now, this might be a little bit difficult because it might be a time when the manager of the business unit is asleep in bed at home, if you're somebody who's booking off a night turn or that sort of thing. But again, I can't write something for every possible circumstance. I think most heritage railways operate in the day and in the evening and not at night. Generally, managers of the business units are going to be around during the day. If it's a weekend, maybe something else will have to be thought up. But hopefully this won't be something that happens very frequently at short notice. So I put manager of the business unit, I'd welcome your views. Now, some organizations, some really big organizations use uh, external medication checking services. That's absolutely fine. Some don't. And I'm sure they're expensive. And so I can't really sit here and say I expect everybody to use an external medication checking service. It should be appropriate for the um, risk. Um, uh, so sorry, just to break off for a second, Andrew Smith has just asked if there was a serious incident and the police were called, uh, would they not test for drugs and alcohol? And if they did not do so, would you be wise to follow their decision? Um, I would say the decision making that the police would go through to decide whether or not to drugs and alcohol test somebody will be different from the decision making that we will go through as a heritage railway. So I would say follow our own SMS policy to decide whether we're going to do it and the police will follow theirs to decide whether they're going to do it. And it could be that we decide no and they decide yes or they decide yes and we decide no or we both decide no or we both decide yes. Um, on the day, of course, uh, the circumstances might not 100% fit um, what the SMS was clearly written for, and a manager can make a decision to do something that's appropriate at the time, um, I'm sure. But that's what I would do. I certainly wouldn't say if the police are not going to test, then we're not going to either, if it says in our SMS that we should test. Right, so back to existing medication. Uh, the member of staff will report this to the manager of the business unit. We hope and we place a responsibility on the member of staff here that if it's been prescribed by their doctor, that they will get some gen out of the doctor about possible side effects on their particular work on the railway. Not because that means um, that person can then say it's okay or not okay, but it just helps to feed into a discussion, which if we're not using an external professional medication checking service, comes down to a decision that's gonna be made internally based on the risk, and that we're going to have to um, stand by um, afterwards. So the manager of the business unit will discuss the medication and the potential side effects with the member of staff concerned and how these relate to the work the member of staff undertakes. So if I turned up and said, uh, hi, manager of the business unit, I'm taking this medication. It makes me drowsy. It says must not operate machinery. Can I still drive the steam train? No, obviously you can't. But separately, somebody else taking exactly the same medication has turned up for a day in the office working with three other people. And you might say, well, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Make sure you're not on your own today. You're not doing anything safety critical. You can be in the office with other people. If anything deteriorates, let me know. And maybe even, depending on the nature of it, of course, one of the other people in the office or if there's a manager there, just keep an eye on that person just in case because they're on a bit of medication. Obviously, it'll have to be treated um, uh, sensitively. And, um, uh, and, and, a, and a decision made based on the risk because the age profile of staff that work on heritage railways means most people are on some sort of medication and we can't reasonably, practicably, there you go, uh, be testing absolutely everything. There has to come a time where we make a decision and we stick to it. Uh, Richard has just pointed out that the definition of company um, should be specified in the SMS lead document. Yes, exactly right. Yes, you can do all that sort of uh, mapping across and you can say where the SMS refers to the office, it means office 6B at such and such a station. Where the SMS refers to the company, it means blah de blah trust limited or, or define it to a company. Yep, absolutely agree. And occasionally, occasionally, come. The, the various companies that are involved in a railway change responsibility for different aspects of the operation. And it's very much easier to change that in the in the overall document than it is to go through every single instance of the word company in the SMS and change it from railway company limited to railway company PLC or whatever it is. Um, in fact, I can think of two occasions this year where 
um, the organization running the company has changed um, you know from X limited to X trust or whatever okay so that's my plan for uh, existing medication if there are risks arising from the side effects if the manager of the business unit says mm, yeah, I'm not sure about this then he will have to seek advice from the company's medical officer or nurse advisor or external medical service provider before allowing the member of staff to continue with their duties. So most railways have a MONA, have an MONA, somebody who does the medicals, and generally that's a friendly person who I'm sure they won't mind if you ring up. Or you might have an official medication checking service, or you might have a doctor on the staff. Generally, there will be somebody, and if there isn't, then I'm afraid if there are risks arising from the side effects, the result will have to be that the person can't work. This is to um, make sure that the railway has done everything reasonably diligent to check that this medication is okay before the person is allowed to carry on working. It's very easy to just say, oh, no, you just can't work then, and that's perfectly safe. But you do have to be a little bit careful because if you just take the easy answer and say, oh, no, you can't work, and the reason you can't work is because you're on that medication and we're not going to bother to look into it, that might potentially be discrimination under the protected characteristics of disabilities if the reason the person is taking that medication is because of their disability. So you just have to be a little bit careful to make sure that you can justify that the reason a person cannot work is because of scientific evidence that the, um, uh, the, the risks arising are, are um, unsatisfactory rather than just um, either we've taken the easy route or we have a blanket ban on, on whatever. Um, <laughs> so let's have a look. Reese Lloyd has just put uh, the civil police won't test other than the standard roadside tests. The BTP will follow the operator's procedure usually. Ah, oh, that's interesting. OK, thanks very much. Right. Finally, uh, section 10. How many sections are there to this? There's uh, oh, 12 and then a bit. So drugs and alcohol related problems. Everything so far has been about how we're going to manage people and how we're going to uh, test them. But we should um, exercise some um, compassion to people who find they have a problem and not just completely cast them out into the road and say you can never work on our heritage railway again. So if a member of staff considers they may have an addiction to alcohol or drugs, they must volunteer the information to the manager of the business unit. And the manager of the business unit will advise them to contact their GP or seek the advice of the company doctor and give them whatever support you can. It's, to be honest, it's no more or less than we owe to our staff and volunteers to help them if they ask for help. And what we need to commit to not doing is, provided this is volunteered to us and not two minutes before you're booked to take the test, that we help that person and we don't just cast them out. We say, right, well, you might have to take a break from the railway for two months while you undertake this rehabilitation course or while we help you do this or whatever it is you've agreed with them that they're going to do. And then once you're clean again, we'll welcome you back with open arms. And thanks very much for not letting it become a problem to the railway. So I think it's really important that we underline that we will really help people um, if they ask us for help. Um, but if you volunteer the information when you're asked to do the test or just after the incident has taken place and you've derailed the train, then that's too late. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll help people that uh, want to be helped. Uh, section 11, if anyone is involved in a drug or drink related police offence, they must tell the manager of the business unit and the manager of the business unit will consider the circumstances and determine if or when the person may resume company duties. And of course, there's a very wide range of drink or drug related police offences. So the manager of the business unit will make a appropriate managerial decision based on the risk and based on the offence and based on the type of work that that person does. Um, as, as to what their continued involvement in the organization is. And clearly it's going to be very different if that person is driving a train to working in the gardens, doing gardening. Clearly it's going to be very um, different based on the seriousness of the police offense that's, uh, that's been committed. Finally, section 12, there was my exemption that um, I referred to uh, when we started to say, wine waiters, bar managers, things like that, non-safety critical people, we do recognize um, that there is an exemption there. 
Right, uh, finally, what I put at the end of all SMS documents, how frequently it's going to be reviewed. I said five years for this one. It's always a bit of a bit of a guessing game as to how frequently we think we should review it. We should consider how likely the law is to change. We should consider um, how new and different this policy is to us. And if it's very new and different to us, we should have a shorter review period on it so that we can see how it's doing. Um, whether we feel this is something that we have a particular problem with or not, you know, all those sorts of things will feed into how frequently it's going to be reviewed. But presuming that there's no exceptional circumstances in those cases, I've put five years. There's all my references so that I can refer back or someone else can refer back to um, uh, refer back to the, the notes that I used uh, to create this. And again, I'd always keep them in a little folder here with the policy so that you've got the actual document just in case the link becomes unavailable in future. Um, that's what I normally do. Well, version history, standard document stuff. And then an appendix, and I've broken my own rule there because I always do uh, numbers in the document and then letters on the appendices. That's what I always do. So appendix A, a poster to be displayed at signing on points on health and safety notice boards is shown on the following page. And there is an A4 size. Let me zoom out a bit so you can... Oh dear, what's going on here? Oh, come on now. There we go. Uh, a extremely brief precy of uh, the drugs and alcohol uh, policy designed for you to put your logo up at the top. Uh, designed for you to handwrite in. You can just about see at the bottom there. If I move the screen down a bit. There we go. To be displayed on the notice board at such and such a location. Just handwrite it in. And just by having this on the, uh, on the signing in board... Just helps to remind people, yeah, there is a drugs and alcohol policy and it is something that we uh, that we take seriously. It's not just there because, you know, it's something we say and not do. You can't claim that you signed on and you didn't know what the policy was or that the policy existed. And just a little A4 poster like that I found uh, was just about the right, uh, the right level to um, just to prick it up in people's minds. So that's my SMS uh, document. It is, uh, well, it's 12 pages long, but two or three of those pages are references and the uh, front cover. Let me go large again, just so, that it goes, so you can see it. There we go. The front cover. So really, when you take, uh, take the cover off, it'll be 10 pages and then it's eight pages of text. I think and I suggest that that is an appropriate magnitude of drugs and alcohol policy for a heritage railway. Uh, now, uh, Reese has asked, is there a standard list of prescribed medication which is acceptable or not for safety roles that could be shared? Well, yes and no. Yes, I'm sure there is in um, uh, medical um, companies that provide medication services. I'm sure that it's being continually updated. And therefore, unless we had a um, mechanism for continually updating our shared version um, I think it would be more harm than good. Um, and second of all, uh, medication checking services do not just consult the list. They are actually properly qualified people to make a judgment um, based on the, uh, the quantity and the frequency of drug that's going to get taken. Um, and especially if more than one drug is being taken at the same time, which is a, a thing that frequently happens. So um, I don't uh, believe that we should have or that we do have a standard list of uh, prescribed medication, which is acceptable or not. And I think if anyone's got one, uh, I think it's a slightly risky game uh, to be playing by it um, because we're not qualified to uh, make that judgment now. It's all very well me saying that and you think, well, you've got to make the judgment, you know, unless you're actually going to subscribe to one of these medication checking services, then you've got to eventually make the judgment. Well, I would far rather the judgment was made if we're not going to use a professional medication checking service. I would far rather the judgment was made by the manager of the business unit, discussing it with the person, reading the label on the bottle and making a risk based decision that they're prepared to stand by rather than blindly consulting a list that might be out of date or might not have the most medically up to date. Um, information on it and saying yes that's fine or no that's not and making the wrong decision. Um, so yes I would love it uh, if there was it would certainly make all our uh, lives a lot easier but no I don't believe there is a standard list um, and as I say if, uh, if there is one floating around I have to say I don't think it's a particularly good idea. Right, before we go, uh, there was another document which we were going to have a little look at, and it's in here somewhere. Here it is. Remember, Procedure 3 of the Function Supervisor's Manual. 
So the SMS has an overall document. Uh, there's a subfamily of documents called miscellaneous, indicated by the Z. This is document number three. There's another supporting document that supports this document. Now, you might argue, well, is that part of the SMS? Is it not part of the SMS? Well, everything's part of the SMS. If it's a document that explains how you're going to run the railway safely, it's part of the SMS. And it needs a number, and it needs a version, and it needs somebody in charge of it. Now, you might say, well, that means everything is part of the SMS. Well, yes, pretty much that is the case. And that's why we have this, uh, uh, this nomenclature issue where we say the SMS... And sometimes we're referring to just the overall document, and sometimes we're referring to the whole system of management and documents and everything else. But the rule is, if it's a document that says how you're going to manage the railway safely, it's part of the SMS. So here's my Function Supervisor's Manual Procedure 3 for drugs and alcohol screening. And I imagine this will be in a separate folder from the rest of the SMS, and each Function Supervisor will have one on their desk that they pull out and go, oh, we've got to do drugs and alcohol screening. Let's have a look and see what it is that I actually have to do. So first of all, at the top, it explains that it's an addendum to the SMS. I've tried not to repeat what's in the SMS here. This just details the particular role of the function supervisor or manager of the business unit in drugs and alcohol screening processes. So first of all, a summary, it will be necessary for a member of staff to be, oh, sorry, it may, ah, it may be necessary for a member of staff to be screened for drugs and alcohol in various circumstances as detailed in the SMS. But because we're going to refer to them here, to make it easier, I've called them A, B, C, and D. Initiating the screening for A and B, for four cause and suspicion, the function supervisor or a higher manager will initiate the screening and take charge of the arrangements because they're the person there on the day. For random and pre-appointment, occasion C and D, which is pre-planned, the manager of the business unit will take care of that. They will be the one to decide a week next Tuesday there's going to be random screening. And obviously it would make sense for either one manager of the business unit to do it on behalf of all or for them to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to be doing the workshop on Tuesday. Do you want me to do a couple of operations staff as well? But the manager of the business unit level decision. Arrangements. The appropriate screening contractor will be contacted and requested to attend. There's the details of our screening contractor. I'll write them in there so the function supervisor knows who to call. And any other information that you get from your screening contractor that says about what to do and how to contact them. Information that you must give uh, when requesting a screening. And generally, the screening companies require you to give some kind of PIN number because obviously by calling them out, you're committing to some sort of expense. So put the PIN number here in the supervisor's uh, manual or put the place where the PIN number is. If you have a secret document of PIN numbers somewhere that's not part of the SMS and door control codes or something, just put it in here so they know where to find it. I've tended to find that most screening companies will do four people when you come out, but your screening company will tell you how many they're prepared to do and you can put it in here. And obviously, if you need to do more than whatever that number is, you're going to have to ask for excuse me, two call outs and get two people, uh, sorry, two call outs and um, to get more than that people done. And of course, what the uh, maximum, uh, the service level agreement is uh, on a call out. I found it's a good idea to state where screening should take place because you have got to think of the person's welfare here, no matter what incident they might have been involved in and whether it was their fault or not, we still owe them some welfare. And it's not appropriate to have somebody going through a drugs and alcohol test in an inappropriate uh, location or where there's not uh, privacy. So depending on the size of your organization and, and the, and the I don't know if you're a railway, the length of the railway, uh, you might have one or many authorized locations. You need to have a private toilet there and you need to have a side room where they can, you know, uh, engage with the uh, testing agent uh, while they're not actually in the toilet cubicle. So you might have one or you might have lots, but a good idea to decide in advance what they're going to be and put them here in the policy. The person must be accompanied at all times. The person must only drink water while waiting for the screening, must not smoke and must not eat anything unless medically required. That's fairly standard. But again, your screening provider will probably tell you uh, what uh, arrangements you should make and uh, you can obviously put them in here. Uh, certainly only prescription medication must be taken whilst waiting for the screening to take place. Uh, otherwise, you've got a perfect excuse to say, well, I wasn't drunk when I had the incident, but while I was waiting for the screening uh, thing to turn up, I, uh, I had a drink. Obviously, we don't want that excuse to try and be used. 
The person may not book off duty, and it is reasonable, I believe, and I recommend to you for the company to expect the person to remain on site until the screening takes place, even if this is beyond their booked finish time. And if necessary, you'll have to make arrangements for them to get home if it means they miss their bus or whatever. And OK, that might mean the person misses their dinner or is late to their appointment or whatever. But we're doing a really serious thing here. We're running a railway and we've got to be able to demonstrate that we take this seriously. So if you want to volunteer here, you've got to accept that maybe once in your entire career, we're going to ask you to stay for two hours if two hours is the call out time. If you happen to be involved in an incident the minute before you were booked to, uh, to book off. That's my view. Uh, the company conducting the testing will arrive and be introduced, keep it friendly, and they will lead in the testing, but the company representative will be present where appropriate. You don't have to go into the toilet cubicle with them um, to ensure the person's welfare apart from anything else. The screening, this is how it goes. The breath sample will be taken to measure the level of alcohol, and if the reading is negative, there will be no further testing of alcohol breath. But if the breath result is other than negative, a second sample will be taken to confirm the result. Um, so pretty self-explanatory that if we're going to accuse the person of being over the limit, we're going to take two tests to make sure uh, we've got it right. Um, the, uh, there is a copy of what's in the SMS here. There's the maximum levels of, uh, of alcohol. And it's in three different things so that if a person has problems breathing into a tube or going to the toilet, then one of the other options can be used. Then there's the urine testing part of it. Uh, the urine sample will be taken away and that normally takes three to five days uh, to get a result from and that's to test for drugs and the limit on drugs is zero. Um, no retesting will be entertained. The test, as long as you've gone to a legitimate provider, is a fully legally defensible test result. There's no uh, saying, oh, I'll do the test again or whatever like that. The outcome will go to the manager of the business unit who will take the matter further under the drugs and alcohol and disciplinary policies if necessary. And the person must not sign on or undertake for company work whatsoever until further notice. Sorry, I should have read the headline. This is in the case of a positive uh, test result. Sorry. Uh, so in the case of a positive test result, no further work until further notice, until you've conducted whatever disciplinary or other procedures that you apply. Uh, if the laboratory analysis reveals that the test has been adulterated, then it shall be construed as a positive result. And then the follow up, how we follow up afterwards after the screening, providing no concerns were returned immediately. The person must be advised that the urine sample test will be available in three to five days. If it was a occasion A or B, which just to remind us were the four cause and on suspicion, the sort of more serious, uh, serious ones then uh, the person must not undertake any work for the company until advised of a satisfactory result. The person must not continue working on the current shift and transport home must be offered to the members of staff at the company's expense. Again, that's a welfare thing because if somebody crashes their car on the way home, having just gone through all this, uh, perhaps the company hasn't done everything um, to, to safeguard that person's welfare. If it's occasion C, which just to remind us was a random, um, oh, there's another typo, look at this, I've got this all wrong. But C, they may continue to work as normal. The company will confirm the result of the urine test to them when it is available. So if there was no suspicion, no incident, if it was just a random, the person can go back to work as long as they're happy to, of course. And on occasion D, which was pre-appointment, the recruitment process may continue as normal, but the person may not commence duties until the results are received. So you could say, well, hang on a minute, that person wasn't even tested and they're allowed to carry on. So why, just because I was tested, am I not allowed to resume duties? Well, it's just the way it is, isn't it? Is that if, if, you've been, uh, if your role has been determined as one that requires pre-appointment screening, then uh, you can't actually start your work until the results are back. But hopefully it's only three to five days, so it's not going to be a problem. In all cases, there'll be receipts. You'll get a receipt from the collection agent when they uh, when they do the screening in the first place, and then you'll get a, a receipt with the uh, with the final result on uh, when it comes later. Quite often, the breathalyzer machine literally prints out a till receipt type thing uh, that you, that you get there and then. Uh, when the results of the urine test arrive, the person who the, who was tested should be advised that that's um, that that's happened, and that if it's negative. They can carry on as normal or resume duties. And if it was positive, the same applies. 
um, no retests, and it goes down a disciplinary route or at least an investigation route um, to um, uh, to see what the next step is going to be. Now, Richard has raised a very interesting point here. What if somebody works for another duty holder? There is a duty of cooperation between duty holders in ROCs. It is an obligation for all of us. Do you advise them? Well, I have been in that discussion from both sides of the, uh, of the, of the fence. I've been in it from the side of a heritage railway, having a person who also works on the main line. And those of you that know me will know I've also worked on the main line and I've had a person there who's also worked on a heritage railway. And it's really, really difficult to answer that one. And I'm not going to give you an answer now um, because... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Hang on, sorry, I'm just reading... Uh, right, uh, because uh, I think if I was to say no, then we'd be breaking the law. We'd be breaking that duty of cooperation under ROGS. And I think if I said yes, then every Heritage Railway volunteer that also works on the main line would immediately resign and not risk their main employment by working on a Heritage Railway. Or maybe not all, but I think it would certainly have an impact. So I'm not going to give you an answer to that one now, but I'd be very interested to hear your views on a sensible, practical way to address that. Because, as I say, from being involved in heritage railways, I've never managed to come up with one. And from being involved on the main line and being in that position of having that discussion, I've never managed to come up with a with a 100 percent sensible um, answer. And we definitely want uh, sensible answers. So sorry that I'm not going to give you an answer on that one. Normally I have an answer for everything, don't I? But uh, not on that one. Uh, Liz has pointed out, thanks Liz, uh, important to note that evidential testing doesn't require urine testing now. Drug swipes and alcometers give quick and confirmatory results. Uh, okay, that's absolutely fine. Uh, depending on the type of uh, testing company or testing equipment that you use, you'll know in your own um, organization uh, what there is and what there isn't. And if there's no urine test requirements, then obviously you can come up here and just delete that. Uh, in order to preserve the paragraph numbers, I'd suggest you keep it like it is and just put not used or something like that in there. Uh, that would be my advice. But yep, you'll know for your uh, for your exact undertaking. Uh, Liz has also said that the disciplinary action might be different from based uh, on a employee or a volunteer. Yes, absolutely. So as far as safety management is concerned, there's no difference between an employee and a volunteer. They're all um, entitled to the same safety entitlements and protections. But in terms of employment law, there is very different. Not least of all, of course, we don't pay the minimum wage to our volunteers. Um, so, yes, it may be um, that the volunteer is just asked not to volunteer anymore, whereas with an employee, it's a lot more complicated process um, to go through. Um, but perhaps that's one for another HOPS workshop where we talk about disciplinary policies for uh, volunteers and employees, perhaps. But yeah, absolutely right. The disciplinary policy will be different uh, depending on uh, whether the person is a, uh, a volunteer or an employee. Uh, and just to confirm, as it says in the SMS, refusal to undergo screening will be considered a positive result and followed up under the same procedure as above. And that's the end of only five pages. And one of those has only got one paragraph on. Uh, that's the end of the function supervisor's manual for how to manage the actual act on the day of drugs and alcohol screening. Right. That's all I've got for you. Thanks very much for listening. It's your last chance to make any comments uh, that you want to. Um, mm, mm, mm. So Adam has just made a comment. Uh, Possibly result away from anywhere. If you were stopped by the police and breathalyzed, you would only be required to tell your insurers and employers if you blew positive away from the railway if you stop by police. So I think what Adam is saying there is if you're stopped by police and breathalyzed, or if a member of staff is stopped by the police and breathalyzed and it's negative, then there's no requirement to tell the railway. Well, yes, I would agree with that. That's absolutely fine because that's not an offense. Um, but if it's positive, then I would say uh, you would. OK, right. So here's what's happened next. Here's what's going to happen next. I did say that the workshop did not end when the video ends. The video is about to end, but the workshop goes on. So um, the next stage is that uh, you uh, consume this video and you formulate what you think of it. And you might think that was a load of old rubbish. I'm not going to listen to any of it. You might think that was really good. I'm going to copy all of it. 
or you might think there's some good bits in there and there's some bits that I think we can do better. And I hope that the majority are the latter, where you think, yep, Danny's put some work into that, but I think we can improve here or I've got better wording for that. Please then send it to me so that I can continue to develop this Word document that we've been looking at today into a best practice. And I'll give it a good week or so, or I'll, if, if the comments are still going on after that, I'll give it a bit longer, but I'll wait for the comments to die down and then I'll publish on Hops this uh, Word document. So it's fully editable, best practice, drugs and alcohol, SMS policy to advanced Hops members. And I'm sorry that it's only advanced Hops members. I would love to do it for everyone, but this all costs money to do. And so advanced Hops members are gonna get it. More than happy to talk to anyone who's a basic HOPS member about upgrading to advanced HOPS. Give me a ring or an email anytime and we'll talk about uh, the circumstances. So please do send that in to me. I'll update this. I'll circulate it out. In six weeks time, we'll have another policy to talk about and we'll do the same again. You're welcome if you're an advanced HOPS member to use any or all or none of the Word documents that, uh, that we publish. So thank you very much to everybody who's contributed to this discussion and to the HOPS discussion in general. I like to think I'm all part of all your teams, that I'm not just some external person who shouts at you every so often, but that I am a member of each and every one of your teams. And I hope that I'm contributing something uh, worthwhile and useful to your railway and to your organization and to your SMS uh, by doing these workshops. Please send me in your comments. I'll publish the best practice template. Don't forget that it's the HOPS Annual General Forum a week today. You have to register if you want to attend the forum. Uh, the link is on System Updates, it's on Facebook, and I'm pretty sure I've emailed it out, and it's in uh, Top of the HOPS. So if you haven't already registered and you want to attend the Annual General Forum, then please do uh, register. And the next SMS workshop will be on Tuesday, the 13th of April, six weeks from today, where we will be discussing, what will we be discussing? Let's have a look. We will be discussing the management of fatigue, risk and control of working hours. Again, I don't think that's going to be anything too um, uh, sensational or too uh, uh, divisive, but I hope that it will be useful and it will continue making these SMS templates for everyone to use. So I hope that's been useful. Thank you very much for all your comments and good night.